Chapter Thirteen of Stories of Old Greece and Rome by Emily Kip Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen Famous Lovers. Part One Echo and Narcissus. Echo was a wood nymph and a follower of Diana, and she had the one fault of wanting to talk all the time, especially if she found someone who was willing to listen. One day Juno went down in great haste to the earth, suspecting that Jupiter was spending too much time in the society of the nymphs, but before she had gone very far into the forest she met Echo, and stopped to speak to her. Now Echo knew that the ruler of the gods was happily engaged with the nymphs, and would not be pleased at his wife's sudden appearance, so she began to talk rapidly to Juno, and to tell her such entertaining stories that the unsuspicious goddess waited to listen. While Echo was thus keeping the jealous queen from seeking for her husband, Jupiter, warned of her coming, left the nymphs and returned in haste to Olympus. When, later on, Juno learned that Echo had intentionally kept her listening, so that Jupiter could make his retreat unseen, she was so angry with the officious nymph that she forbade her ever to speak again, except to repeat the last word of any conversation she might hear. Thus she could never more tell beguiling stories, or interfere in behalf of Jupiter. At first Echo was very miserable over this misfortune, but in spite of it she managed to spend her time happily in the forest, and to hunt with the other nymphs of Diana. One evening, as she stopped at a brookside to drink, she met a handsome youth named Narcissus, and at once fell in love with him. But unfortunately she could not tell him of her affection except by languishing looks and sighs. Narcissus was not at all pleased by her evident interest in him, for many maidens had loved him, and he had turned coldly from their advances, preferring to roam the forest alone. Some time later Narcissus was hunting with a companion, and, having rushed away in pursuit of a stag, he found that his friend was no longer in sight. He called to him, but no one answered, except the devoted Echo, who was always dogging his footsteps. When Narcissus called, "'Are you here?' Echo replied, "'Here!' "'Come!' cried the youth, and Echo answered, "'Come!' Then she appeared before the young hunter, and mutely begged for his love. But Narcissus scornfully turned from her, exclaiming, "'You shall never have me!' "'Have me!' cried the unhappy maiden, but her frank offer was repulsed, and the hard-hearted youth turned away. Echo made no further attempt to win his love, but went into the mountains to live out her sad life alone. No one ever saw her again, and in time she pined away and died, but her voice remained to whisper among the hills, and to give back the last word to any one who sought to call her. As for Narcissus, his scorn of love brought its just punishment, for Venus decreed that he should suffer even as poor Echo had done. One day, when he was hunting in a remote part of the forest, he came upon a beautiful deep pool, in which all objects were reflected as clearly as in a mirror. No wild things had ever come to drink of the cool stream, no feet of beasts had ever trampled the grass on its margin, or muddied its pure waters, not even a floating leaf had ruffled its calm surface. When Narcissus knelt on the lush grass at the pool's edge, and looked down into the clear water, he was surprised to see a beautiful face gazing up at him from the depth of the pool. He leaned nearer, and the face did not withdraw, but seemed to approach his own. Then he put out his arms to the water-nymph, who, he believed, was returning his advances, and he was delighted to see two white arms stretched out, as if to clasp him in their embrace. But as soon as he attempted to grasp them, there was only the cool water in his hands, and the nymph had vanished. When the surface of the pool had grown clear again, and Narcissus leaned anxiously over it to see what had become of this baffling maiden, there she was still gazing at him with her beautiful eyes. Again and again Narcissus strove to embrace her, but she eluded his eager arms, and each time he clasped only the unsubstantial water. Maddened by these repeated defeats, he spoke reproachfully to the water-nymph, and asked her why she thus tormented him. But though the lovely mouth so near his own seemed to move as if framing words, no answer came to his appeal. Each day Narcissus sought the forest pool, and each day he found the nymph ready to return his smiles and fond looks, but always escaping from his touch. By and by he spent all his time beside her, 
and cared for nothing else than to gaze beseechingly into the lovely eyes that looked into his own with the same fever of longing absorbed in the adoration of this strange being who seemed so responsive to his passion and yet so unwilling to allow him near he forgot to eat or sleep and became only a wan shadow of his former self the nymph too was pining away with hopeless love for her face grew pale and thin and the deep-shadowed eyes were full of sadness sometimes narcissus slept from sheer exhaustion but when the moonlight fell on the calm water he would wake with a start and look anxiously to see whether the nymph was sharing his weary vigil and always he found her waiting there in the cool depths of the pool finally he grew so sick with longing that he died of his hopeless love without ever knowing that it was no water nymph whom he adored but only his own reflection the gods believing that such devotion should not go unrecognized changed him into a white flower which bears his name and this is usually found blooming beside some clear lake or tiny crystal pool part two pyramus and thisbe in far-off babylon there dwelt a youth and a maiden whose families lived in adjoining houses with a party wall between the two estates as the heads of these households were sworn enemies in spite of their proximity the wall was made so high that no one could climb over it much less see what was on the other side the maiden thisbe as she walked in her garden often wondered who it was whose feet she could hear pacing up and down along the wall and one day she was delighted to find a small crack in the masonry which enabled her to peep into the adjoining garden about this time young pyramus was planning some way to scale the wall when he too discovered the same chink and when he peered cautiously through it he found to his great joy that there was a sweet-faced maiden standing near who hastened to assure him that she did not share in the family feud this acquaintance soon ripened into friendship and pyramus and thisbe spent many hours standing patiently by the chink in the wall which was the only way in which they could exchange confidences soon they grew dissatisfied with this meagre allowance of space in which to see each other for by this time they had become so much in love that the tender whispers breathed through the broken wall only made them long to be together without this cruel barrier between them so they planned to steal away from their watchful parents on a certain night and meet just outside the city walls at ninus's tomb where a great white mulberry tree would hide them in its protecting shadow accordingly at the appointed hour the trembling thisbe wrapped herself closely in her veil and crept out of the house finding that she had come first to the trysting place she waited under the mulberry tree and idly watched the moonlight shining on a broad pool that lay close to ninus's tomb suddenly a lioness stole out of the bushes her mouth bloody with the recent gorging of oxen and slunk down to the pool to drink thisbe terrified at the sight of the creature's dripping jaws fled into a nearby cave for refuge but in her fright she let fall her silken veil and it dropped on the ground near the tree the lioness having drunk her fill walked over to the tree and sniffed curiously at the bit of silk then worried at it with her blooded teeth as a dog plays with a rag just as the lioness departed pyramus came hurrying to the trysting place and seeing thisbe's torn and blood-stained veil with the print of the lioness's feet on the ground he was beside himself with remorse and horror being certain that his beloved had been torn to pieces by some wild beast he cursed his own carelessness in letting her come first to a spot so full of dangers then he drew his sword exclaiming that he no longer wished to live now that thisbe was dead he called upon the mulberry tree to bear witness to his oath of undying devotion and then fell heroically upon his sword uttering the name of thisbe with his last breath as his blood gushed out upon the ground at the foot of the tree the earth absorbed it so quickly that the white fruit of the tree turned a deep purple and its juice became like drops of crimson blood all this time thisbe was hiding safely in the cave and when she at length ventured out she gazed fearfully around to be sure that no lioness was lying in wait to devour her when she reached the spot where she hoped to meet her lover what was her terror and dismay to find him stretched dead upon the ground with her veil held close to his parted lips realizing what had happened and that it was too late now to convince him of his terrible mistake thisbe knelt down beside him and vainly strove to bring him back to life finding this useless she seized pyramus's sword and plunged it into her heart 
determined to die with him. As she sank forward on her lover's lifeless body, she prayed the gods to have pity on her great love, and to allow her to be buried in the same tomb with her beloved Pyramus. The gods heard her dying prayer, and answered it, by making the hard hearts of the parents relent, so far that they consented to bury the lovers together. A costly tomb was erected over them, as a fitting monument to these two unfortunates, whom life so cruelly divided. Part three, Hero and Leander In the town of Cestus on the Hellespont lived a beautiful maiden named Hero, who was a priestess in the temple of Venus. Most of her time was spent in the service of the goddess, but when these hours of attendance were over, and she was free to leave the temple, Hero was glad to seek her own dwelling-place, which was a lonely tower on the cliffs, overlooking the sea. Here the maiden loved to sit, watching the white-winged gulls as they skimmed over the waves, or listening to the breakers as they dashed angrily against the rocks at the foot of her tower. The beauty of Hero was famed throughout the countryside, and many a youth sought the temple of Venus at festival time under the pretext of honouring the goddess, but really to gaze upon the lovely young priestess. Among those most eager to see the maiden was Leander, a youth who lived in a town just across the Hellespont, and within sight of Hero's tower. When he joined the solemn procession that came to do homage to Venus, he saw the beautiful priestess, and determined to win her in spite of the many restrictions that forbade even an acquaintance with one dedicated to the temple. Ignoring the thought of the inevitable punishment that would be meted out to him if his rash presumption were known, Leander managed to find an opportunity to speak with Hero, and to tell her of his love. At first she would not listen to his pleading, but at last she was won by the sincerity of his words, and consented to disregard her sacred vows by receiving him in her tower. Leander did not dare to visit her until nightfall, and as he would have to swim across the Hellespont in the darkness, Hero promised to put a light in her tower, so that he might have some beacon to guide him as he breasted the uncertain sea. When night came and Leander stood impatiently on the shore, waiting for the promised signal, suddenly a torch blazed in the distance, and he knew that Hero was awaiting him in her lonely tower. He plunged fearlessly into the waves, and though the current was swift, he struck out boldly, and was carried out of its dangerous grip. Now and then he looked up to where the light was still burning, and his heart beat fast with hope when he saw it grow larger and brighter as he neared the land. At last he reached the rocks at the foot of the tower, and was soon standing beside the trembling hero, who had feared each moment to see him sink beneath the waves. The lovers were so happy in being together that each night Leander swam across the treacherous sea, and Hero placed her torch in the tower to light him on his perilous journey. All summer they lived in this idyllic happiness, but when winter came with its storms and its icy hand, Hero feared for her lover's safety, and begged him not to venture into the sea. Leander laughed, however, at her fears, and continued to brave the narrow stretch of water that lay between his home and Hero's tower. The wind often beat him out of his path, and the icy water numbed his limbs, but he kept bravely on, with his eyes fixed on the welcoming light. One morning a fierce storm broke over the sea, and increased in fury through the day, so that by night the waves were lashing themselves madly against the rocks, and the wind beat the seagulls back to the land. Hero dreaded the approach of that hour when Leander would start on his nightly journey, for she knew that he would not hesitate to risk his life in the maddened sea for the sake of being beside her. When the time came for her to light the torch, she did so reluctantly, hoping that Leander would not come. On the opposite shore stood the impatient lover, waiting for the accustomed signal, and when it blazed out into the night he plunged boldly into the waves. But now the sea was too strong even for his experienced arms, and the huge waves tossed him about as though he were so much foam. The wind and rain beat upon his defenceless body, and the cold sea gripped him in its deadly embrace. He struggled bravely to make some headway, and called upon the gods for help, but his cries were drowned in the howling of the storm. His strength began to fail as he fought desperately with the current, grown terrible in its swiftness, but now and then he lifted his head weakly above the waves, to see whether Hero's torch were still burning. Just as he was making a last heroic effort to reach land, a sudden gust of wind blew out the light, and seeing this, Leander, with a despairing cry, gave up his unequal battle, and sank down into the sea. 
The next morning, when Hero, anxious and fearful, stood on the rocks at the foot of the tower, she saw Leander's body, which had been tossed there in wanton cruelty by the waves. Unable to endure this sight, and not wishing to live any longer now that her lover had perished, Hero threw herself into the sea, and when the tardy fishermen came to launch their boats on the furious waves, they found the white-robed body of the young priestess lying dead beside her faithful Leander. Part 4. Pygmalion and Galatea Pygmalion, king of Cyprus, was a sworn bachelor, and had shunned the society of women for many years. He was also a famous sculptor, and spent all his leisure hours carving wonderful things out of marble and ivory. Though he would not deign to admire any living woman, he had lofty ideals of feminine beauty, and loved to carve statues whose perfection of form and exquisite grace surpassed any charms that could be claimed for a flesh-and-blood maiden. Once Pygmalion made a beautiful ivory statue that was such a marvel of loveliness that even the sculptor himself became enamoured of it, and lavished upon it a devotion that was hardly consistent with his supposed indifference to love. This perfect creation he called Galatea, and he treated her with all the extravagant fondness that a lover bestows upon his mistress. He brought her presents of quaint seashells and delicately perfumed flowers, beads, pearls, and the rarest of jewels, even gaily coloured birds. Sometimes he hung a string of precious stones about her neck, and draped her white body in softest silks, treating her in every way as a maiden reluctant to be wooed. When the festival of Venus was being celebrated, Pygmalion joined in the procession, and placed a rich offering on the goddess's shrine. As he did so, he looked up towards high Olympus, and prayed Venus to grant him a wife like his peerless Galatea. The goddess heard his prayer, and, as the patroness of all true lovers, she inclined with favour to his wish. So when Pygmalion returned to his home, and hastened into the presence of his adored statue, he was bewildered at the change that seemed to be coming over it. A beam of sunset light that was streaming in through the open window had touched the ivory coldness of the statue, and warmed it with a rosy glow that made it look wonderfully soft and yielding. But this was not all, for as the astonished sculpture stood wondering at this unexpected answer to his prayer, the beautiful face of Galatea turned towards him, and the perfect lips parted as if to speak. Breathlessly Pygmalion watched the statue gradually warming into life, and when he was at last assured that it was no longer a piece of unresponsive ivory, but a breathing, blushing maiden, he knelt adoringly at her feet, and besought her to be his queen. End of chapter 13